Okay, so we've just finished talking about the perpendicular flows, E cross B, diamagnetic, and then they sum together and give us only a diamagnetic perpendicular flow. But, and we did that with a perpendicular momentum balance equation. What we also, or now want to consider, is the parallel to the magnetic field momentum balance. And here, uh, when we say parallel, if we didn't have a magnetic field, this, uh, this is also what would happen. So what would that be? Well, it's just mn dv parallel by dt is equal to nq e parallel, and then, and then there would be a b dot v cross b, but that's uh, the Lorentz force has no parallel component, so we have only minus del parallel p. We often will find it interesting or simplest or something like that to consider cases where the electric field is equal to the minus is minus the gradient of a potential, namely electrostatics. That will make life much easier in many cases. And if that's the case, then our E parallel would be minus grad parallel phi. Where grad parallel is, you know, we'll often have our Z directed um, um, magnetic field, and so that'll just be a derivative in the z direction. So with that in mind, our momentum balance equation, we usually then just write it as mn uh, dv parallel by dt is just equal to minus nq del parallel phi minus del parallel p. Now, um, there, so this is our momentum balance equation, and we're now going to talk about some about a particular set of approximations that gets used on this. And there's two basic approximations. One's called an adiabatic, and the other's called a fluid. And we will often use this shorthand word, adiabatic and fluid, to mean what I'm going to do. So it's really kind of um, uh, something we'll keep coming back to. So let's say two types. Uh, of, let's call it either approximations or limiting cases. And those are, uh, and, well, and those are adiabatic response, which is in some sense going to be, you know, omegas much less than something or other. And the other is a fluid response, which is in some sense omega is much greater than something. And we'll worry about the something a little bit. The tricky part will be that we will be doing this not just for the species as a whole, but it may be true that, say, the electrons are adiabatic and the ions are fluid-like, or both are adiabatic or both are fluid-like, or something like that. So it turns out um, that, let me just put as a parenthetical remark then, either of these conditions is possible for electrons or ions. So now I need to tell you what do we mean by these responses. So the first one we'll consider, okay, is the adiabatic response. Spell it. Now, our equation here, um, our momentum balance is that. And we know that in some sense what we mean by adiabatic is that omega is much less than something. And in some sense what it is is it's sort of like the typical velocity, the typical parallel velocity, divided by some parallel gradient scale length. So it's sort of low frequency compared to how fast particles can uh, oscillate back and forth and smooth things out. Or this could be a k parallel, v parallel for a wave or various things like that. So um, this is um, sort of slow relative to particles smoothing things out. 
Um, so what does that really mean? Well, if we look at our momentum balance equation, there's the only d by dt in the equation. And what I mean then is slow compared to, and if I convert my grad parallel p into a, um, a temperature times a density times a grad n, then you can show that this is indeed something like the ordering you get. Anyway, the net result of that doing that is that your momentum balance equation then just becomes nq grad parallel phi minus grad parallel p. But again, we always like to just take p is equal to nt, and density is, uh, I'm sorry, temperature is constant. So therefore, we can write this equation as 0 is equal to, uh, and now I'm going to divide through by the n and by the t, and so this will become minus grad parallel of q phi over t, and then minus grad parallel uh, n all divided by n, but that is none other than grad parallel log n. Again, we've constructed it then in a form that I can integrate it easily. And what it says then is that logarithm of n is equal to, and we'll have to stick this over on the other side, so it's minus q phi over t plus a constant. And so if we have an adiabatic response, what we find is that the density of x and t is then given by some equilibrium density. I'll choose my constant here. Ah, I'm sorry. Right, I'm moving off to the bottom here. We don't need our original equation. I, my... Aha, p equals nkt. I don't believe in k. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, we'll, we'll almost always just uh, uh, be talking with uh, EV electron temperatures. And so uh, I will just uh, actually, what I've done is I've said KT is T. Uh, so I just avoid it. <laughs> uh, and I've taken gamma equals 1, so I've even simplified that part of it. So I have, what we have in mind then is that if I have some density in equilibrium and not of X, and then any potential that I put on will simply cause the density to be distributed as n of x and t is n naught of x times exponential of minus q phi of x and t divided by t. And the temperature t is a constant. So this just says that whatever the potential does, then for an adiabatic species, the density of that species will arrange itself according to this. And this relationship and this law uh, or, or representation or simplification of the momentum balance are either called, they're often called in the business a whole bunch of things, and so it's a little bit unfortunate. But anyway, they're often called the Boltzmann relation or alternatively, this is sometimes called the Gibbs distribution. Or finally, uh, sometimes people, just because it is the adiabatic response, um, uh, seem, seem just call it the adiabatic response. And you can have it. Uh, either in this form, which is nonlinear and exact, or you can have it in um, uh, various approximate linearized forms. Now, um, suppose I came along, you remember when we had our, pair, our momentum balance equation, we talked about the fact there were a few more terms that maybe came in here, like the divergence of a stress tensor and like a, a frictional force, okay? If I put in those, okay, they would break this adiabatic relation. And so any extra terms, even a time-dependent term, if I left it over here, any extra terms would give me non-adiabatic contributions. Most of the time we don't end up worrying about that, but when, when you get into more advanced uses of these things, uh, those become important. So the idea is that additional contributions to the momentum balance will give us those non-adiabatic responses. So that then what, what happens in that case is you get this thing, and then you get 1 plus 
the non-adiabatic responses. So you, you usually end up with, to lowest order, an adiabatic response and then a little bit of a correction to that. If you had finite, for instance, if you had finite frequency, you'd get omega over, say, a K parallel V thermal, we'll find later, is a, a non-adiabatic correction to this. Okay, so that was the, of the responses here, that was the adiabatic or slow response. Particles move back and forth real quick, you know, and they adjust real quick. And the other response that we need to have is just the opposite. The particles are stuck someplace, not moving very much, and uh, maybe I've got an oscillator I'm applying to the medium, and it's uh, jiggling up and down real fast. Now, I might say that we'll often have situations where electrons can be the adiabatic species because their thermal velocity is 40 times that of the ions at the same temperature. So they're real fast running guys, okay? So they, they respond to any electric field very rapidly. Ions, on the other hand, we might have high frequency oscillations compared to their ability to follow them. So often we'll have adiabatic electrons and fluid ions, but sometimes we'll have both, that, both adiabatic or both fluid. So let's now talk about this uh, fluid uh, response. What we have in mind here, okay, is that the frequency is much greater than something, and the something is, again, the rate at which I can remove inhomogeneities in the direction uh, along the magnetic field. Uh, and this is, you know, again, a, a K parallel, V parallel. So these are, in some sense, fast processes. Then what happens is our equation mn dv parallel by dt uh, is then equal to minus um, nq del parallel phi and then minus del parallel p. And what we mean is it's, this is fast compared to thermal motion. Uh, grad p is, is actually, you know, p is nt, and so the t represents the thermal motion. So in, we end up neglecting that term here. So in this fluid response, okay, this is the equation that we're interested in. And often we're interested in uh, n phi and v parallel going like e to the i k parallel x parallel minus i omega t, you know, wave-like uh, responses. And for that case, our equation here becomes then just minus i d by dt is a minus i omega. We'll do more of this later, but I just want to sketch how it works. So it's minus i omega m n v parallel twi twiddle, we'll call it as a fluctuating quantity, is then approximately equal to minus, uh, well, yeah, minus i k parallel n q phi tilde. And the n's cancel out on both sides. Um, and the I omegas cancel out, and what you find then is that V parallel tilde is approximately equal to Q parallel Q phi tilde uh, over omega M. But the main feature um, is that uh, it's high frequency, so thermal motions are insignificant compared to frequencies. Yeah, question? Oh, in plasma physics, K will not necessarily be related to omega. Uh, we'll <laughs> it'll be related. We'll come back to that next time, basically, as we start into uh, waves. Uh, they will be related through dispersion relations, but those dispersion relations will be sufficiently complicated that we often just take them as separate quantities, and then we compute them in the end. Okay, now, so next I want to talk about something which, is, which Chen calls the plasma approximation. And the idea here is that we have a more or less adiabatic response because electrons are assumed to be pretty fast-moving guys, and we're interested in uh, pretty um, fast or pretty slow processes that we're going to be observing. So uh, we expect, let's put it this way, omega much less than something or other, say like the plasma frequency or V thermal over L parallel or something like that. And so uh, 
for electrons at least, and maybe for ions as well, but certainly for electrons. And since they're the fast-moving guys, that's generally what we most worry about. Um, that being the case, uh, this gives us then an adiabatic electron response. Um, so if we go back to what was our adiabatic electron response, it was this, uh, this response right there. And so what we expect is that n of x and t, maybe I should have made that x parallel here, but because we were only dealing with the parallel part, but I sort of went away from that and <laughs> made it more general at that time. Anyway, uh, let's suppose I don't have, uh, let's say for this discussion for the moment, uh, no magnetic field, just to sort of simplify things. Um, so then N of X and T would be, say, N naught, E to the, now for electrons, of course, uh, we have QE is minus E. And so this becomes E phi over T. So what this means, if we have such a, an adiabatic electron response, is that if I have a plasma that has an, order, uh, an arbitrary density in it, but then, you know, I got a little higher density in sort of one particular region, so this is N as a function of X, then I'm going to simultaneously have to have a potential distribution which is also, you know, peaked up in that region. Now, physically, what's going on here? Well, physically, if I had a, 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 an increase in density in this region, what I really mean is I have an increase in both the electron density and the ion density at that particular position, okay? Now, so now I just sit here and I let all the electrons and ions go. The electrons for Te of order Ti are fast-moving guys, okay? So what happens is the electrons start roaring out real quick, and they try to leave the ions behind. Well, if they do that, if they've left there, then I'll have more ions there than I had electrons. The net result of that is I'll build up a potential, namely a positive potential, and this is just exactly the right amount of potential I need to hold the electrons back. So uh, the basic idea phenomenologically is if um, n is higher, or n e equals n i is higher someplace, a potential phi, or I'm sorry, change notation, let's leave it phi, uh, builds up to hold electrons back. What this sort of says is that, and, and we could go back and use our parallel momentum balance equation if we wanted to do that. Um, what this says is, in fact, that the, um, the, the, the plasma wants to kind of roughly stay quasi-neutral, right? So let's just uh, sort of conclude that. So plasma wants to stay or remain quasi-neutral. Quasi-neutral means more or less neutral, very close to neutral, okay? And if that's the case, then if we go and solve Poisson's equation, del dot E is rho over epsilon naught, our lowest order is always rho is approximately zero. And we shouldn't solve this equation for E, it turns out. So let's put this don't use to determine the electric field, or phi. The problem, or the reason is, that effectively what we end up doing in plasma physics is the plasma is highly polarizable, okay? 
That is to say, we put on the least bit of a little bit of an electric field, and the electrons go running around in response to it, and so there's a high polarization because of that. So uh, plasmas are highly polarizable. So what we need to do is solve rho polarization as a function all of the electric field is equal to zero. So we're going to spend a lot of effort trying to calculate the polarization charge density if we apply an electric field to a plasma. And in particular, we're going to try to look at waves in a medium, in, in, a, in a plasma medium. You could also, instead of setting polarizable, you could say it also as a medium with a high dielectric constant. And so the, the big thing is we don't want to use Gauss's law very often to calculate the electric field. Rather, we calculate the self-consistent electric field by setting the polarization charge density produced by the induced by an electric field in the plasma. Okay, so this is this is what's sometimes called the plasma approximation. It's more or less quasi-neutral. Uh, oh, another way of saying this, sorry, I should have said, is that we'll have that Ne is approximately equal to Ni. And one species might be adiabatic, the other one might be uh, uh, fluid-like. And so, you know. But the basic idea is the plasma wants to remain more or less neutral, and so it's not a good idea to try to calculate the electric field this way, except at the edge of a plasma where you have a sheath running into a wall or something like that. Okay, this kind of completes what I want to say about the um, fluid descriptions of a plasma. And next what we want to do is we'll start into Chapter 4 of Chen and the corresponding chapters in uh, uh, Bittencourt discussing waves in a plasma. And waves in a plasma are in some ways the, the, a big part of the discussion of plasmas because pragmatically, a if you hit a plasma, uh, you, you perturb it, it responds with waves. Uh, it's a, it has wave-like responses many times. And, and certainly that's the easiest thing we can calculate. And so the net result is that we will uh, spend a lot of time worrying about if I jiggle the plasma using these sorts of plasma descriptions, fluid descriptions I've talked about, what kinds of waves can propagate similar things to sound waves and so forth. So start reading on Chapter 4, and then we'll get into that uh, next time.